Yeah, Roughly well, you know what? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, the, when, when I talk about this, you'll see that the infection rate data that they're giving you are meaningless. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. And, it's very and contextual, so, actually. The interpretation is very contextual. You need to give it a proper context only, then your analysis probably can be can be a little more sensible. But I read lot. your paper. I read your paper, which you have written, and that's a very close observation about this COVID nineteen infection rate, particularly. Well, that, that's that that's the important point of that paper was hmm. was you know this is what really should be done if we want to understand it, hmm. and obviously the epidemiologists just don't understand research methods. That's true. That's true. That scares me. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you uh, know when you. When you put things in context, look at the, mm. the, the doctors that are in head are, are, are in charge of public health mm. are trained in medicine. They're not really trained in epidemiology. So what they're doing is they're relying on their epidemiologists to provide them with data that they believe. So they believe they're epidemiologists. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait to slam the epidemiologist. I'll do it in my talk, so. Mm. And the other thing is that everybody, everybody and their brother and sister out there is listening to their doctors. And I'm not sure if it's the same case in India, but in the West, medical doctors have become deified. And the, the issue is this, is, a good medical doctor is good at diagnostic problem solving and a bad mm -hmm. medical doctor is not. Um, and so essentially they're no different than good and bad plumbers or good and bad electricians, mm -hmm. okay? Um, mm -hmm. They're just paid more. Mm -hmm. And my dad was a medical doctor. And I, I used to say that, I said, you're an overpaid oh. plumber. Um, and, uh, so 98% of medical doctors know absolutely nothing about research mm. methodology. Oh, so when they, when they read their journals, they read the abstract, mm. they might read the methods, they mm. don't read the results section because they, have, they, they couldn't do a t-test if their life depended on it, uh, on it <laughs> let alone interpret a factor analysis. Okay? Okay, okay. And then they read the results. And so the bottom line is, they're believing their peer review system. But the whole point that we, that we publish papers is that, that things progress mm. because people, even, even in published research, people say, well, yeah, mm. but what about this, right? And, mm. and you know, here's the next step. Well, a medical doctor couldn't design an experiment if her or his life depended on it. Mm. So, uh, so, Doctors are not scientists, except for 2% of them, and they work at research hospitals and in mm. those sorts of places. Uh, so 2% of the doctors are scientists and 98% of them aren't. Mm. And your doctor, if your doctor is good, she or he is good at di diagnostic problem solving. <laughs> and that's it. That's what you want in a doctor. You should go in with a little oh, okay. test, diagnostic okay, problem Robert, solving test. Uh, Dr. Robert, it, it's four. So shall we shall we begin? Dr. Malvia? Sure. Dr. Malvia? Sure, sir. Sure, sir. We, can, we can. May, may I request you to kindly uh, welcome uh, Dr. Robert Sinclair and formally open this webinar? Sure, sure, sir. The permission Dr. Of Sinclair, it is, it is quite interesting to hear from you, sir, your views. Uh, I, we formally welcoming you, sir. Uh, Thank you. Respected Vice Chancellor, sir, Professor Dr. Muddu Vinay. Uh, whose initiative has been this thought leader web series, my IBS Dehradun Apex team, Dr. V. N. Saxena, my faculty colleagues and my staff colleagues, my students and all the participants. It's a pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Robert Sinclair to the ninth session of this thought leader web series of IBS Dehradun. Dr. Sinclair is the president and CEO of Sinclair and Associates, consulting based at Ontario, Canada. He is also the advisory director for Global Mining Sustainability, a company based at Canada. 
he has been a distinguished professor of psychology at universities of international significance some of them include laurentian university university of alberta central michigan university and pennsylvania state university dr sinclair has been invited to deliver talks across the globe he has received funds for many research products and has uh, over 2800 citations it is a pleasure to have you sir as a keynote speaker for this thought leader web series of ikfa university dehradun i invite you dr sinclair to share your views on the topic unfolding international business in the era of covid-19 global pandemic over to you dr sinclair thank you thank you for that introduction it was more than i deserved my pleasure sir okay um initially when i was asked to do this talk and i said you know talking about post pandemic um i said well i don't think we're i don't think we're post pandemic and i don't think that we're in a uh in a position to actually talk about uh, uh the economy and business models uh in a post pandemic situation so why don't we just talk about it in the context of a pandemic um and until we have a vaccine uh we we're not going to be out of the pandemic and anybody who thinks there's going to be a vaccine in 18 months i'm willing to like make put you know if you're a betting person I'll, i'll i'll take you know at least a bet over a coffee um the epidemiological models that that talk about the curve are problematic and as i borrowed from from uh from Shakespeare the, the curve is a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing um and and the reason for that is that their mo- the, their models are based on um invalid data and flawed assumptions and and the, let's just go back to to you know methodology 101 kind of thing is um the way that that they're they're using number of infections as they're using number of cases as a proxy measure for number of in- infections so who gets tested well the people in the front lines get tested the people who have symptoms get tested and then the kinds of people who actually want to be tested get tested well that's a biased sample it doesn't represent the population uh in general so it's unreliable and and it's also based on assumptions that epidemiologists tend to uh uh dream up in the night so it's it's not valid and you know it over in in the united states right now it's become politicized so what's happening is uh you've got uh epidemic third rate epidemiologists who who've sold their souls to the republican party you also have third rate epidemiologists who've sold their souls to the democrats and of course the assumptions used by the ones hired by the republicans say we can just go ahead and reopen our economy and the ones being paid by the democrats uh are are say are 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 using assumptions to say oh no 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 we shouldn't reopen our economy um what should we really be doing we should be using objective measures and the only objective measures that we have right now are deaths per million and it's an okay measure there are some problems with it there's some error variance but but it, it's relatively objective and i actually started out doing this just looking at canada and the united states and then a little while after that and and it was because i was just interested uh had nothing better to do during the pandemic and i was making this prediction that there was going to be that that just because of of our um the our approach to closing the borders and 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 this sort of thing and how how more quickly we reacted based on the us that our infection or that our death per million rate was going to be lower and it was going to rise and it is it has and it continues to if deaths per million can't decrease because it's a cumulative measure right 
but what but the real curve the real curve is deaths per million go up and then they turn to the right and they don't go up any significantly so uh that's what's starting to happen around the entire world right now uh except south america brazil brazil uh it, it, it's not happening uh, and Mexico is in the unfortunate position of being sandwiched between the United States and South America. So Mexico is having a bit, bit of a problem too. But um, when I started doing this, and I eventually started including other countries, including India and, and Pakistan. Um, and what I found, what I found was countries that were that had immediately shut down their borders and countries that are not that that didn't act like the western world have death per million rates that are far far lower than the west and so you know india as of june uh let me see i just got to look at my notes here uh, where are we? India is, uh, as of June 20th, you're sitting at nine deaths per million. Compare, compare that to Spain, which is sitting at 605 deaths per million, okay? Mm -hmm. India, over the last 16 days, has increased by less than one le one death per million per day, um, and and Pakistan has increased by less than one death per million per day. See, and if we were looking at Canada and the United States and Western Europe, again, what happened is their death rates went their their death per million rates went really high before they leveled off and didn't increase that much. That's the real curve. That's not the fictional curve that the epidemiologists who can't think out of the box weren't telling you about. But the real thing is, what we really should have been doing from the get-go is stratified random sample testing every two weeks, okay? And um, now in Canada, that would mean just 1,500 people and 1,500 different people every two weeks. And that tells us exactly the, the infection rate. It tells us exactly the percentage of the population who is uh, asymptomatic and wandering around spreading the disease. It tells you exactly where you should be doing more testing, more targeted testing, because there's no way that you're going to test 100% of the population. So you need to use an approach that's going to give you the population parameters, a really good estimate of the population parameters it, using you know, methods that are, are reliable and valid. Anyway, that's my slam on epidemiologists. Okay, so I think I'm just, I, I just explained what I was gonna explain here. Mm, yeah, yeah, okay. I was reading about this the other day. Um, Siberia is experiencing its hottest weather in history. The permafrost is melting. I think we have to approach business models and economic models from now on, assuming that we're always going to have a pandemic. Okay? Who knows what kinds of ancient diseases like viruses and bacteria are hidden in the permafrost and there's no way we have any immunity to them. Not a chance. And they may be way more deadly than uh, uh, COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 so far has only killed 0.005% of the world's population. The Spanish flu pandemic, now I don't want you to confuse COVID with the flu because COVID's more like the common cold, but they had the same, they have the same looking, their death curves look about the same. 
The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920 killed 5% of the world's population. That's a massive difference, 0 0.005 versus 5%. That's a big difference. So let's, let's assume we're always going to be the, on the cusp of, a, of another pandemic. So will we ever live in a post-pandemic economy? I'm not sure it matters. Uh, let's assume we never will. And everything we talk about, it's going to, it's going to form the basis for a new, new approach. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to be talking about India today in general, but look at this applies to the entire world. Uh, but you guys, you, India, India and Pakistan are both being proactive. So are, are Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, um, and uh, uh, China has not been uh, as proactive as they should be. So I'm going to focus on a few things today. I'm going to focus on manufacturing tourism, women's rights, you're going to wonder why is this guy focusing on women's rights in this kind of talk, but I think you'll understand. Agriculture, uh, even though Rajab didn't want me to talk about it. <laughs> no, no, so, no, no, Dr. Robert, you can talk, you, you can take your time and talk agriculture as well, please. We'll be, anyway. we'll be happy to listen. <laughs> so for no, I, that, that was just a joke. Uh, anyway, so uh, for manufacturing, tourism, and agriculture, we have a really simple strategy. And I'm gonna, you know, it, over here in, in 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 the United States and Canada, the introductory classes are always the number of that class is 101. So psychology 101 is introduction to psychology and marketing 101 would be introduction to marketing. Okay. It'd be in your, your first year as an undergraduate. Absolutely every product and every tourist destination from and in India is safe. Okay. And the whole world needs to know that. Now, Let's, let's, manufacturing. I'm referring to the entire supply chain here. So I, we're going to, uh, can you hear me? Uh, bolo, bolo, aage, yeah. Yes, uh, Akhilesh, can we mute Garden all the B702. participants? Akhilesh, can we mute all the participants? Yes, sir. I'm just hearing other other voices. That's all. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, sorry for that interruption, Dr. Robert. You can continue, please. It's okay now. Okay. Um, so I'm talking. I, I, I'm referring to the entire supply chain. So we're going from raw materials to production to shipping and warehousing on one end. Uh, so on the production end to shipping and warehousing, housing and delivery uh, on the destination end whether it be vehicles, cell phones, steel, agricultural products, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I had an experience yesterday. Um, I went to uh, buy, I went to buy this lovely gray shirt that I'm wearing today. And they've reopened the shopping malls, but they've got, you know, physical distancing requirements in the malls. And I went to the store that I wanted to go and buy the, the shirt at. And um, I had to wait outside of the store, physical distancing from the entrance. I was the only one in the lineup for enough people to come out of the store so that I could go into the store, okay? And they provided me with a mask and they got me to sanitize my hands. And then I went around and I found what I wanted to find. And then it took me a little longer to find somebody to open the, the chains room to try on my clothes. And then it took me a little longer to actually check out and pay for my clothes and leave the store. Now, people, people in the West, uh, they want everything done yesterday. 
okay? And it's not going to happen here because we're going to have to continue to do this properly. Otherwise, we're going to get spikes. And don't confuse a spike in COVID-19 with a second wave. This is what's happening in the US because of the haphazard way they reopen. They're getting spikes left, right, and center. So, so in the, if you're talking about man, manufacturing clothing, um, the textile industry is massive in India, Pakistan, and uh, China. And you guys have all the technology. The technology for textile manufacturing does not exist in North America. So you got raw materials. So we'll talk about my shirt. I was going to talk about steel, uh, but, but I decided I'd talk about my shirt because it's more relevant today. today. You've got raw materials like cotton going in to producing these shirts. And then they go to your textile plants where they're converted into whatever kind of material and they're dyed into the different colors. And then they're, they continue along a line where they need, you know, they need to be sewn into shirts and then they need to be packaged and then they need to be shipped, except, and then, well, they need to be warehoused, they need to be shipped, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, we need to go from the cotton fields to the delivery end in whether it be the United States, Canada, Britain, internal destinations in India, other places of Asia, Australia, New Zealand, wherever, it doesn't matter. There needs to be a guarantee of safety at every step along the way, okay? Uh, so that's, that's my idea. So real safety, corporate responsibility, and perceived sa safety are key. Now, in my mind, real safety must be the same as perceived safety, and it must be high. Okay? So um, everybody out there knows that perceptions are often far different from reality. But in this situation, I want the perceptions and reality, be, reality to be equal. They have to be the same and they have to be high. There's gotta be safety. I just wanted to bring this up. You know, I don't wanna see any more Bhopal disasters and I blame this on the West and I blame this particularly on the United States for taking advantage of India and other developing nations where, uh, to be blunt about it, big American corporations see the value of human life as being worth less dollars to them than it is in the West, okay? And, and that's just absolutely unethical. So uh, I want corporate responsibility involved and the corporate responsibility needs to be involved inside of India too, throughout the entire manufacturing process. And there's gotta be buy-in by the government. Um, shoring up of, of environmental laws in India. That the, whole, the whole reason that Union Carbide moved its plant from West Virginia to Bhopal was because the EPA in the United States would not let, let them operate in West Virginia anymore. So they said, well, fine, we'll just move it over to India. And they were taking advantage of Indian environmental laws that were not on par with the environmental laws in the United States. Of course, Trump wants to take, tear apart all of those laws. And just as a fun fact for you, speaking of the environment, Vandana Shiva taught me introductory, introductory uh, philosophy in my first year as an undergraduate. Uh, and she's made uh, quite a name for herself in the ecology movement uh, over in India, I understand. Um, okay. I can't see the top of my slide. What's the top of my slide say? <laughs> Indian corporate responsibility, sir. Yeah. Okay. Guaranteeing 
This is more marketing 101. Guaranteeing worker safety through the entire supply chain, including at international destinations. This means um, ensuring proper physical distancing, whether people are working in the fields producing cotton, all the way through, and, and masks, mask use, hand sanitizer, that kind of thing, all the way through the in entire supply chain. It also means changing the manufacturing. And this, this ranges from installation of conveyor belts that are rel relatively inexpensive to robotics that are uh, relatively, ex relatively expensive. Um, you need to have government buy-in here. And I'd suggest trying to uh, lobby the government to get provisions of, of certificates of safety associated with anything produced in India and around the world, actually. Uh, that will go a long way to making the, to, to having the perceived, the, the, the perceived safety out there. Because you need to realize, and you do, is people have really bizarre beliefs about this virus. And they're going to have very bizarre beliefs about every virus. You know, I was in a lineup and I'm listening to somebody saying, oh, this is airborne. And I'm going, shaking my head. Airborne. I said, if it's airborne, it's like a cloud over the top of us and we all have it and that's it, okay? Just because this can travel two meters uh, through somebody coughing or sneezing does not mean it's airborne. It's based on droplets that contain the virus. Um, I think I said all this stuff. Greatest importance, and I'm going to get back to this later. We need, this, is ha this has happened in North America, not to the extent that it should, but it's changing. But India's a little bit behind the times here. There's got to be, there has to be more female executives and there's got to be no glass ceilings. And I'll come back to this in a bit because this ties into the women's rights issue, okay? Um, in order to move India to the first world, and you guys are on the cusp of being the first in, in the first world, you don't want feminists around the world saying boycott India because of how they treat women, right? This, this is not a good marketing strategy. So what do you do? You have to have a cultural shift and that, has, that cultural shift has to come internally. And as we spoke about on the phone, it, it has to be in a, in a matter of goal setting. I'll get to that later. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about the, the uh, metaphorical war between the elephant and the dragon uh, and and in my view, this has to be won by the, by the elephant. And I'm not talking about what's going on in the Kashmir right now. I'm talking about a metaphor. Um, uh, women's rights and protection, protection of work, workers and government cooperation are of utmost importance. The West won't proceed in coalitions until these conditions are met. And so India needs to be proactive and forward thinking. China's not. Uh, China's concerned about China and it's concerned about making money. And it's got a labor force that's the size of your labor force and it gets, and their labor force gets paid about the same amount of money as your labor force, but if it costs, if your labor force, if the average wage 
of someone is, I'm just going to pull a number out of, out of my head here. Cause I was talking with an IT specialist who was getting paid $50 US a month. And he said he lived like a king. He's single and he lives like a king. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to pull $50 US out of my head. And look, if you're talking the difference between $45 or $50 and uh, so $45 in, in, in China, $50 in India, but you can market India as being socially responsible when we know that China is not, okay? Uh, and there's ample evidence for that. They've been implicated in human rights violations. Uh, India has not, I'll come to that a, li- a little bit later on. But we also need to think about a, a, word, a world trade and defense alliance that includes a bunch of the companies that are countries that I listed here um, and, uh, and, and some others. I didn't, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. That is more than half the world's population, right? And if you look at what, in, or what uh, China is doing in the South China Sea right now, this is, uh, is, this is a problem. And this is something that we're gonna have to contend with. Um, India has the potential, in my opinion, and it must, in my opinion, evolve into a first world country, okay? And don't for a second think that there are no poor people in the United States. Canada, we take care of our poor people much better than the US does. We have social safety nets, much like they have in in Western Europe, but don't think that the West doesn't have poor people. It does, okay? Uh, You know, some people think that the United States is the land of milk and honey. I lived there for 15 years. It's not the land of milk and honey. (laughs) Um, And the other thing that we have to keep in context right now is the US is an an unreliable ally. Uh, look, Look at what they did to the Kurds, okay? So, United States aligns themselves with the Kurds. Trump pulls out all of his forces. Of course, Erdogan considers the Kurds a t- terrorist group. So genocide is committed on the Kurds, on the Kurds, and essentially that the that population of Kurds no longer exists. Okay, thanks, Mr. Trump. Uh, so we're not only talking corporate responsibility, we're talking government responsibility, okay? And the United States government right now is unreliable and it has no ethics. Uh, I don't know, ethical politician, is that an oxymoron? It's like, you know, military intelligence, standard deviation, jumbo shrimp. Tourism. Tourism might be the the industry that has been hit worse internationally. Uh, My friend and colleague, Gina, who's uh, presented an excellent paper, a conference I was involved in in May, has been addressing issues uh, involving the reopening of uh, of the Philippines to tourism. And these people have thought in detail about everything. So she taught, she talked about a model that involved reducing the capacity of flights in and out of the Philippines to 30% of their full capacity so that you've got social distancing on the flights, uh, distancing between groups in hotels and restaurants, tourist attractions, beaches, that doesn't mean that if you go with your family, you have to physical distance, but it means that your family or your group of friends or whatever, you need to social dis- or physical distance from other groups of people. Uh, um, because I'm going to get to this later. Obviously, the world economy has to reopen. We can't, we can't live in a world where the economy isn't open. Right now, the economy is open for trade across borders for particular products. 
So you can get steel, okay? You can get agricultural products, but you can't have people coming in and out across borders. Uh, and that's killing the tourist industry. Now, India is having the same, the same problem. Every, every country out there is having the same problem, is we have to reopen the tourist industry. One of the things that Gina talked about is, is you know, this, there's going to be a reduction in the number of tourists, but they're, they're, they're being really proactive there. They're using things like robotic maids for cleaning rooms and that sort of thing, uh, and changing beds. And uh, so there's less human to human contact in the hotels. Um, all of the safety rules that I described in the manufacturing area apply to the tourism area. So that's nothing new. Um, we need to reopen our, 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 our world tourism economy. And I know that this is hitting India because this is the time of year that people from the West would be heading over to India. Um, the smarter ones that wait until it was like, you know, the middle of winter here. Uh, and uh, <laughs> where it can be 10 below zero. Um, agriculture, it's the same thing. Physical distancing, mass, mass use from the fields to the international markets, government certification, potentially less reliance on migrant workers. Um, now, here's why I'm saying that. A hundred years ago, 32% of Canadians were involved in, in, in agriculture. Today, it's around 2%. I'm borrowing this little discussion right here, this three sentence discussion from uh, an, economist, an economist that I was listening to on a radio program. So I'm not gonna say this is, this is mine. I'm, plagiar I'm not gonna plagiarize, but I don't remember who he was. But the point was this. A hundred years ago, if you told people this, that, you know, 30% of that, well, well, of the 32% that are involved in agriculture, there's only going to be 2% in it in a hundred years. What are you going to be doing a hundred years from now? Well, nobody's going to say, I'm going to be a internet technologist, or I'm going to be a web designer, or I'm going to design robots. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> it's, it's not like jobs get lost. It's like job descriptions change. And this happened in Walmart uh, in the United States. They haven't done it here yet. Um, what they did was they bought robotic um, janitors to clean the stores. And apparently these robotic janitors are very good and they immediately go, something gets spilled, they go and clean it up. And then what they did was they took all of the people who were janitors and trained them, trained them to work on the floor. Because if you've ever been to a Walmart in North America, it's next to impossible to find somebody to help you. They realized this was a problem, so nobody lost their jobs. It was just a, a, re, a, a redefinition of job description. Now, you also need to get female executives involved in agribusiness, and again, no glass ceiling. Now, when I said less reliance on, on migrant workers, the reason things dropped to 2% in Canada is because of, of things like, you know, combines and tractors and technology. So a single farmer can use a combine and do an entire field of wheat that would have had, you know, a hundred workers on it a hundred years ago, right? One person can do it. So that automation becomes involved. Okay, women's rights in India. If you want to become a first world country, women's we are we, there's a there's an issue with women's rights that we need to deal with. Um, there has to be a cultural shift. If not, India is going to be attacked by feminists from around the globe, and you really don't want that. And again, back to markets marketing one hundred and one. So um, 
one of the things I'm going to do when I come to India is I'm working with uh, Herbasha on a project, and we've got a few other collaborators likely on board. And we're, we're initially going to do some experimental research involving probably four factors in a, in a, in a two by two by two by two factorial experiment. And, and we're going to be addressing issues related to rape culture, which this is a big problem because India's got a really bad name internationally with respect to the, this rape culture issue. Um, arranged marriages. This is another issue. If women don't look as though they're, they are free, then they're not free in the eyes of the world. And de facto, they're going to be being seen as being treated like chattel. We got a problem with a caste system that is, is perceived internationally as being uh, irrelevant and also racist in, in some sense, OK? The construct of virginity is problematic, especially in the in the in this sense of this double standard in which you're in where it's it it seems to appear to be fine for men to engage in premarital sex, but not women. Okay, so this is something that we need and and to change this, you have to take baby steps. It's goal setting. It's just like if if you were if you were doing a a, a goal setting lecture to your uh, to your your MBA students, and you're explaining the goal setting literature, and you said, "Look, you don't set. Here's my goal. My goal is I'm an entry level executive at an organization. Here I am, and I want to be the corporate vice president. Okay, well." If your plan is just to go from A to B, you're not going to get there. So you have to design a program that involves these very small and attainable goals. And for the students out there, if you haven't read the goal setting literature, you should because it'll change your life. And it's 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 empirical fact. OK, it's based on science. It's not based on somebody's opinion. So. Uh, there's experimental data and quasi-experimental data that backs up the, the goal setting literature. So we're going to set a small attainable goal. And then we're going to set a, a new small and attainable goal. And each time you attain a goal, you, 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 other, you, you, you continue up this little almost like a Gutman scale uh, until you reach the ultimate, ultimate goal, which is changing attitudes towards women. Um, now, um, we're going to develop a program, and it's going to be uh, a quasi-experimental approach for this. We're, we're going to do the, the, the initial experimental stuff is just paper and pencil, and what we're going to be varying is the dress that people are wearing, are wearing, uh, sex of respondents, male, female, uh, uh, high caste, low caste, uh, and we got some other factors in there. And then we're going to be measuring things like, you know, whether she was asking to be raped, you know, this kind of stuff. We're also going to have some general questions about attitudes toward women, etc., uh, because. This rape culture thing's got to go. Um, and don't think for a second that blaming the victim doesn't happen over here, except that it's changed a lot. <laughs> victim rights has changed a lot here. So, uh, and, and in fact, people aren't even referred to as victims anymore. They're referred to as survivors. And see that the... the when I read about rape culture in India, the thing that's problematic is that the family of the survivors feel guilty and the family of the perpetrators don't. 
and that's got to be reversed is that the no woman asked to be raped okay doesn't matter how she's dressed there's not you, i i'll survey 5 million women say do you want to be raped i'll bet you not one says yes okay so this is this whole this is a problematic issue Anyway, but the program is going to involve the quasi-experimental multiple time series design with switch, switching replications because, of course, we can't randomly assign people to, you know, where they live in the country and that sort of thing. Um, and, of course, it, it can't be this random white guy from Canada who's just the face of this program. It's got to be successful Indian women. And, uh, and we want to actually... Uh, I, I believe that we're, we're in a position where we can address this more within Hindu culture um, and within ex is Islamic culture inside of India. That's another thing that we're varying in the experimental part of the, of the, of the uh, um, study. Uh, and in more uh progressive is islamic nations like uh morocco um but we're not going to be able to do something like this in iran for the you know not the, the for the foreseeable future but india is a great place for focusing on this because you have many 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 successful young female academics Okay, and they have to be the face of this program. They have to be the people who are the role models for girls and young women, and also for providing the antithesis of what's going on now to boys and young men. We also need professional men advocating for change. So we need inclusiveness, we need executive positions, we need no, no glass ceilings. So now, I, I don't know, you can't see, on my screen, you can't see Prabhasha, but here's the thing. We got random white guy who I don't know, I don't even know what it says because my, you know, Hindi's a little rusty. Um, but, I, you know, I don't, I, I, it could say Bob's a bozo. Um, but, but, okay, successful professor, assistant professor of English, as the face of the program and a few other successful women. Now she and I are actually collaborating on developing the experimental stuff and the, uh, the, the, program, it, the, the program itself, but we need to have people on board who can act as role models. This is a perfect, she's a perfect role model. I've got a lot of female Indian friends who are academics, who are perfect role models. And I've got a lot of female uh, Pakistani friends who are perfect role models. And I've got a, 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 a bunch of female uh, academic friends from Morocco who are, are, are good female role models. Anyway, so who are you gonna believe? This guy over here with the same sunglasses on the top of his head. No, they're different sunglasses. Uh, here, I'll turn them into the same sunglasses. There, with the same sunglasses on the top of his head, or are you gonna believe her, right? You're gonna believe her. Okay, new world economy, women's rights, safety, physical distancing, automation, government buying and support. This is all marketing 101. I mean, we're going to engage in marketing 101 for India. And online sales. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Online sales have boomed. We've had, we've had companies, and I'm sure the same thing has happened in India, that had, you know, kind of a four or five year timeline for putting together a total online sales approach to things. They did it in two weeks when the pandemic temp, pandemic hits hit. Okay. Five years work in two weeks. Why? Because otherwise they're going to go out of business. Uh, now, none of us are going to be the next Jeff Bezos. Okay. Plus he doesn't pay taxes. Lucky guy. Can the world 
economy remain a clo remain closed. Well, we talked about this already. No, there's no way the world economy can remain closed. And our internal economies can't remain closed either. So uh, we're going to have to take the steps to, to reopen everything. But we've got to do it extremely carefully because this pandemic is not over and the next pandemic might be around the corner. And if the next pandemic is around the corner, we've already get, got everything in place. We've got everything in place so that we can just continue to proceed with a global economy. So uh, ethical economics. Come on, wave your hand. You developed, you, you came up with the term. That's your term. Put your hand in the air and wave. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so we were, talk we were talking about this the other day. Ethical uh -huh. economics. <laughs> It's it's different than ethical it's it's different than business ethics and let's go back to the ele elephant versus the dragon. India has not been implicated in any human rights violations, whereas China has. Okay. Um, India ha has enacted worker protection legislation, whereas China has not. India has never hidden problematic issues from the world, whereas China has. Um, I don't think, I don't believe that China knew about COVID-19 before December, but I believe that it was around since probably September when I look at the data if you got 2 billion, 2 billion people noticing 3,000 infections just is unlikely, okay? So I'm not gonna put lay blame there. I mean, in Canada, where we got 38 million people, you'd notice 3,000 infections, right? But you wouldn't in a, in a country the size of China. But where I will lay blame is they tried to hide it from the World Health, Health Organization. And that's a problem. India is a democracy with a young population, whereas China's an autocracy. And I don't care whether you say it's communist on one side or fascist on another side, is any place where somebody's a president for life, it's an autocracy, regardless of whether the roots of the country is in, co in communism or the roots of the country is in fascism, it's irrelevant, it's an autocracy. And look at reproduction rates in China right now are negative. They're losing, they're losing people. You have a young population in, uh, in India. Both countries are moving toward high tech. I, you know, I've got to say that about both countries. You can't argue that the Chinese aren't, aren't highly involved in tech because if you did, you'd be kidding yourself. But this like all gets back up to ethical, ethical economics. <laughs> okay, so India has shown a commitment to the Paris Climate Accord. China really hasn't. Both countries need to address, address women's rights. So what I'd like to propose is that we turn India into a first world country. I've laid out what I believe your target goals need to be. You need to do the goal setting. I'm more than willing to help chat with anybody about the goal setting, but it has to change. Any questions? Students, if you have any question, uh, you can write it in the chat box. Yeah, well, let me let me just get out of the share here. Okay. 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 Dr. Robert, can you address the question from the chat box? I think there are a couple. Uh, of... uh, okay. okay, well, hang on. I, I, I got to have people slow down here. Somebody asked me, when are we going to see this shift? I said, well, you know, okay. Okay. I'm hoping we're going to see this shift quickly. And I think she was re referring to the shift with respect to women's rights issues by 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 looking at her. I could be okay. wrong. Um, 
somebody's asking about HR. Well, the mm -hmm. HR, the HR analytics are going to have to be an intimate part of selection and promotion equations, ensuring that um, that that uh, people are not discriminated against based on their caste or their sex. Um, so, you know, I'll give you an example. We were doing some, some work when I was in graduate school with a police force in Wilmington, Delaware. And what had happened was they'd been, that there's a, the EEOC in the United States says that if you're if your promotion or selection rate of protected minorities and protected minorities are women, blacks, and Hispanics in the United States, um, is less than four fifths that of white men, then you have a prima facie violation of the equal opportunity laws, equal, equal opportunity laws, and that means that the burden of proof to show that, to demonstrate that your discrimination was legal, shifts to the organization, okay? And they lose all the time, they lose. Um, so police department, you had people who are thinking, you know, here's the kind of things that need to go into a selection equation. It's like, you know, they, so for example, being able to shoot a target, you know, from some distance and, uh detective work collecting clues whatever and then they also threw in um physical uh physical prowess that involved like you know how much weight you could lift and that sort of thing well it turned out that their selection equation was actually a pretty good selection equation except that more men were being promoted than women and more men were being, pardon me, more men were being hired than women. This was a selection equation. Um, and well, it also turns out that their physical, their, their physical strength measure was not in its, in their regression, regression equation, in, in their selection equation, was not significantly predicting job performance, uh, but it was discriminating between men and women. So they had to pay millions and millions and millions of dollars in reparation, okay? Um, and then they hired a group out of Penn State to make sure they did it right the next time because they didn't wanna to have to pay millions and millions and millions of dollars in reparations again. And you know, the, the issue is that this, the people that are running HR in these places, it's not that they're stupid. It's just that they're not as sophisticated as we are. So they don't understand when a particular item in a selection, in the selection equa uh, equation uh, is just problematic. And you have to, you have to prevent that from happening. And if you have a good selection equation, it won't happen. Here's the other thing that a lot of corporations did in the United States that was wrong is they, they said, well, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go out and hire a whole bunch of minority people who actually don't meet our standards. And what you're doing is you are setting those people up to fail. Okay, that's wrong too. So what you need to do is you need to do this the HR analytics correctly. You certainly need to be building selection equations and performance equation, equations, and they may involve work samples for you know for for the for uh, for for a job with the police. You you can create little tasks, a work sample task that. You know, the typical one that you think about when you're doing an MBA is an in-basket task for, you know, promotion to some junior level executive. But you do the same kind of work sample thing when you're hiring police, you can do that. You can do it for hiring store clerks, store managers, okay. Um, anyway, with these violations of the equal opportunity laws, the corporations always lose. 
And sometimes the payouts are not just millions, they're billions, okay? That's true, that's true. Um, uh, Dr. Robert, there I've are only a couple seen, of I've, always, I've seen one situation where the corporation showed that their discrimination was in fact legitimate. And it was the San Francisco Fire Department and part of, of their um, selection equation involved things like carrying 300 pounds up a ladder or down a ladder on your back. Well, guess what? Genetically, men and women have different physical strength limitations and so it turned out that, yes, this did discriminate between men and women, but it also predicted job, job performance very well. Caveat on that. If you find a woman who can do that, you better hire her. Okay? Uh, Dr. Dr. Okay. Robert, uh, Dr. Robert, there are a couple of questions on tourism sector. Uh, as I sense, as I mark out from these questions, students are probably... Uh, willing to know that what are the safest methods to open the tourism industry it is contributing uh, to the global economy in fact every country majority of the country many countries in fact if you see they are dependent on tourism but now yeah. you see the opening of tourism sector may have a risk because uh, there may be larger number of infected cases so what well, you, shall be taken what, what is your opinion on that okay well it uh, I don't know if you read the newspaper yesterday or the day before, but the EU has said they're not going to reopen. They're not going to reopen the uh, tourism. Uh, tourist destinations to the to Americans. Okay, mm. I mean, it, okay. And it makes per, it makes perfect sense to me because they don't have their COVID under control. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, that you, it, you're going to have to do this on a country by country basis. I mean, uh, you know, Thailand is sitting at less, less than one death per million. It's been sitting at less than one death per million for since April, okay, or May or okay. something. Yeah. Um, Cuba, same thing, kids, really low rates. So you can reopen your country uh, to certain tourists and you got to be careful you need to be careful about other tourists now here are other things that i i'd suggest and um gina is actually a better person to talk about this but but anyway my suggestion would be when you bring people when people come over you've twisted the tourism industry a little bit so that they're kind of quarantined for 14 days. So they're in a nice area, in a resort, but they really can't go out of there for 14 days. So you don't want them to feel like prisoners, but you don't want to reinfect your country, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this, this involves some creative problem solving on, on the part of tourist operators is, is look, you're going to have to stay here. We got lots for you to do. We have all of these interesting things and blah, 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 and swimming pools and whatever. And, uh, and cultural events will have people who are coming in and are going to be doing traditional dances and, 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 and that sort of thing. And you know, spend a couple of weeks here and then you can just go out wherever you want. Uh, Dr. Robert, is there any way out? Because of course we cannot open the tourism industry, but it employs a lot of people. It creates a lot of jobs. So is it is it a way out to minimize the loss due to this closure of tourism industry? That's a huge segment. Huge number of employees are employed there. Well, is one of the things that you need to do out. is grow. One of the things that you need to do, and we're doing in Canada right now, is growing our internal tourism industry. Because... Okay. We okay. know that our external tourism industry isn't going to be re reopening all that soon. Uh, I mean, especially like we've we've come to another agreement to keep the American border closed for another month. And if okay. things keep going, going down the, the Trump tubes in the United States, I'd be more than happy to keep the American mm -hmm. border closed for the next mm -hmm. three months till mm -hmm. after the election, until somebody's. Then after the election, 
if Trump is still in power, I'd say just turn close the, mm-hmm. close the border down totally, mm-hmm. uh, except for trade. See, we're having no problems over here with trade. Is mm-hmm. Steel comes in and out. Aluminum comes in and out. Food comes in and out. <clears throat> mm-hmm. The truck drivers have to, the truck drivers, the transport drivers, they're driving the big rigs and things, or the trains, okay, like the engineer on the trains, well, they take a two-week holiday after they come across, right? Mm-hmm. They quarantine, and then they go back. But we got, you know, we need more truck drivers now, actually. We need more people who can drive, you know, these big semis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and in Canada, in Canada, those are high-paying jobs. A truck driver can make $80,000 a year. That's more than an assistant professor, just just oh, an, as an FYI, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, now, now, of course, their uh, that limit on their on their uh, <clears throat> pay range is going to be lower than that. But anybody who went into academia thinking they were going to get rich was a fool, um, because they didn't know anything about opportunity costs. Mm-hmm. I might have been okay, Doctor Dr. Robert, there is another interesting question. Uh, this this uh, student want to know what is green what is uh, green energy's impact on international economy uh, during COVID. Uh, I don't know what is his understanding of the the word green energy. Can you throw some well, light you know, on that? Mm-hmm. I read an I read an article yesterday, I believe, or the day before. Okay. That's a time. My time frame is kind of weird because I'm in and out of of the ability to be on the internet. Um, mm-hmm. But that was I, I think it was in the Economist. If you check last week's Economist. Um, they were talking about, and it might have been in the online version. I mean, I get both. I get the online, and I also get the print version of the Economist. Uh, and for those of you who don't, I say it's really a worthwhile magazine to read. It's not, you know, it's not something you want to use as the basis for your uh, decision making. But it's there are some interesting editorials and interesting articles. And. Um, The shift to green energy, I think in the grand scheme of the world is going to be absolutely beneficial. We already know okay. that okay. we already we already know that that um, CO2 emissions and methane mm-hmm. emissions and and everything has come down during the pandemic because everything was shut down people weren't driving their cars people weren't going anywhere and we've seen this in terms of of air quality okay and we've seen that we've actually seen it in terms of the health of forests mm. so if we can shift over to green energy in the grand scheme of things we may even be able to prevent uh more negative impact of of uh, of climate change now mm-hmm. i think that i'm not convinced that the call me uh hopefully hopefully idiotic but i'm not or hopefully moronic maybe that's better i'm a hopeful moron um i I'm not convinced that we've gotten beyond the point of no return, as many people would like us to believe. Mm -hmm. I don't want us to get beyond the point of no return. But the more that we can shift towards green and and burning less uh, coal, and that sort of thing, uh, the better place the world's going to be. And, you know, I, I'm in the process of building a solar system out where I'm building my house. Solar panels are not terribly expensive right now in North America. And the Chinese are producing these things that, you know, and just shipping them all over. 
Um, India should be producing its own solar panels. You've got the technology. You've got, I, I mean, there's a massively huge high tech uh, sector in, in India. I'll be able to generate enough electricity that I could feed back in to the uh, grid, except there, I'm nowhere near the grid. There's nothing, I'm actually literally in the middle of nowhere, okay? Um, I'm on an island surrounded by water, <laughs> surrounded by other islands uh, in an area that looks kind of like a lake. Actually, it looks a lot like that that in that picture right there. Um, and um, people are now in Canada putting up solar systems and, and you have to understand, I'm a long ways above the equator than you are, okay? Um, and I can still have a solar system work throughout winter here. <clears throat> long as there's sun, you got solar. And I got a, I've got a backup, backup generator if I need it. I've never needed it. But the people that are doing this in the cities are putting up solar and instead of paying for electricity, they're selling their electricity back to the electrical grid, okay? So this can pay for itself. And if everybody did that and we weren't burning coal anymore, we might get, a, the, get rid of the electrical grid. Electrical engineers would shift their, their, what would happen with electrical engineers is that their job description would shift to being mm -hmm. solar electrical engineers. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. same thing happened with, my mother has a cleaning lady, a woman who comes in and, you know, my mother's 85 years old. And uh, so she has a woman that comes in uh, once every two weeks to clean some, some stuff up. But I also, for, for Mother's Day or her birthday, I forget which, I bought her two iRobots, one for her main floor of her house and one for her upstairs. So the robots do all the vacuuming. So the cleaning lady's job description changed. She didn't lose her job, right? but her job description changed to, you're doing all this other stuff now, like, you know, mm. polishing silver. It's, silver is something I never want to own, okay? My mother has silver, she's inherited. It's been in the family for, you know, 250, 300 years, who knows? Anyway, this stuff tarnishes. I don't, it's like, what, you got to work? Do you have to work to keep this stuff shiny? I, don't, I got better things to do with my life. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, so job descriptions change. And the robot does, does just as good, if not a better job That's true. than any, That's any true. cleaning lady ever did. That's true. That's true. Uh, Dr. Malvi, I suppose uh, we are crossing the time limit, so it is over to you now. I suppose let it be the last question. I'll stay on and talk to anybody who wants to talk. <laughs> I'll just take one more question, Dr. Sinclair. Okay. And okay. it's a pretty interesting question by one of our students. She is from the MBA second, uh, second year. Her name is Khushbu Agarwal. She has asked that tourism has been a major catalyst in boosting international business, whether it's for pleasure or whether it's for business purpose. But uh, she wants to know, post-pandemic, uh, will it be able to climb to the previous peaks? There will be, in fact, there has been... I, well, uh, you know what? People yes, like sir. to travel. People like to travel to exotic places. I don't think that's going to change. Um, I do. Uh, I don't know when post-pandemic is going to be. <laughs> so, um, but sometimes, sometimes, sometimes we have to start thinking about what's the new normal. And right now, the new normal is. You wear masks in certain places, you clean your hands with sanitizer, you wash your hands for, you know, 20 seconds with warm water when you go in and out. Um, you try and maintain physical distancing. And that might be the new normal. Of course, tourism is going to come back. Will it peak at the levels it was before? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because if we have to put in place these physical distancing requirements, 
forever and ever, um, you're only going to be able to run at 30% capacity, 25 or 30% capacity. So what that's going to translate into is that the cost for the tourist is going to increase or the margins for the tourist operators are going to decrease <clears throat> or both. Okay. <laughs> Probably okay. both. Mm. I, you know, I, 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 again, I'm going to be hopefully moronic here is uh, Bob, the hopeful moron is I hope everything comes back. I hope for the sake of the world, everything comes back and look at, there are a lot of us out there. We're all smart people. We need to be the ones making the decisions and not the government. That's the problem. See, politicians, politicians are out for one thing, to get reelected. And so they don't wanna upset anybody because they've become, their job is they're politicians. My job is, I don't care about politics, is I care about the data and what the data say. And we need more of us driving the government. And the problem with the scientists who are advising the government or the people from business who are advising the government is A, they're, aff they're affiliated by virtue of some political party and contact and B, they're not the smartest of us because the, the people who, it, it, it gets back to the epidemiologists. The good epidemiologists have jobs at universities and tenure track positions. The ones who aren't, weren't good enough to get jobs in academia and tenure track positions end up working for the government, okay? So they should be listening to us, all of us. And I'm talking about us broadly defined in the academy, not to the hacks that are advising the politicians whose only motive is to get reelected. So the politicians need to be working to solve this problem, but they need to solve this problem properly or, or more people are gonna die. And you guys are looking good. I'm looking at your numbers. Yeah, that's, we'll get back to, we'll, we'll go right back to being in the top right now. Yeah, your infection rates are going up, but your infection rates are only going up because people are being tested. Now, are you, are you, what are your real infection rates? We don't know because nobody's done the right research. So you need to get on the government and tell them to do the right research. Do random sample testing across India. Now look at, you know, you're sitting at about what? One point, almost 1.5, 1.4, 1.5 billion people somewhere in that range is you're going to lead, need a lot bigger sample size than I'd need in Canada. I only need 1,500 people to get a really good handle on exactly what's going on in Canada. You're going to need a bigger sample size. But it's not like this is expensive research to conduct. It's a, it, it can be mailed out, mailed back. And all, it's a self-administered test gets sent back to a lab. And, and you can have a few attitudinal questions on there too. Of course, you need demographics, you need sex, you need age, you need things like ethnic background, that kind of thing. And, and then we know everything, exactly. Nobody wants to do it. Till they do it, I don't know where we stand. But yeah, I'm gonna be an idealist and say, One day will we, we will be back to peak tourism. It's not going to be this summer. It's probably not going to be next summer, but it's going to happen. It's going to happen. That's true. That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. And I, as I said, I'm more than willing to sit here and chat with people if you want to chat, as long as my mother makes me another coffee. She just <laughs> got up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinclair. In fact, we all are, uh, are positive along with you, sir. If it's not possible next year, maybe in fact, in a couple of years time, we'll reach, uh, the, the peaks will start to come. How, how uh, uh, what the peaks will be, we do not know, but certainly well, we peak, like to the be- The peaks in tourism, I want to see come back. I think the peaks, yes, the peaks in COVID-19 death rates are already there, except in parts of South America. 
mm-hmm. everything. Look, New Zealand has basically got nothing now, mm-hmm. as far as they can tell. But again, we don't know because they didn't do the right research either. Okay, because no country has done the right research. Uh, and yes, uh, you could send them a copy of that paper where I say why nobody's done the right research. <laughs> Anyhow, I said, I, I basically explained at the beginning of the talk, nobody's done the right research. Um, and it doesn't take a one, it doesn't take a 140 IQ to figure out that, uh, that, that they haven't been doing the right research. Uh, you know, I'm sitting here with like, you know, an 80 IQ and I figured it out. So, so anyway. Um, so at times, at times, sir, they are afraid of the right research. It seems. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Nobody wants to know the truth. Thing, in fact. And no, so no. You know thing. what? They it, they want to stick their they want to stick their like ostriches and stick their heads uh, in the correct, sand, correct, which is interesting correct, correct. because ostriches actually don't do correct, that. Correct, 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 correct. <laughs> they 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 are they, they are in fact happier with the filtered and tilted information, which is more suitable for them. One good thing which I'd like to share, sir, positive thing about India is uh, what we are seeing in the reports, number of cases which are recovering from COVID, the percentage is going up. So that is something uh, something positive for uh, for us. Yeah, no, I've been, I've been looking at that. These recovery rates, the recovery rates are good to know. Yes. Me, you know, essentially, if you look at Italy, for example, okay, it, Western Europe wasn't prepared. You people were prepared. India shut down right away. Thailand shut down right away. Vietnam shut down right away. Myanmar shut down right away. Philippines shut down right away. Indonesia shut down right away. Idiots in Europe and North America didn't shut down right away. So, um, so if you look at Italy, that uh, it had, let's see, there, they were sitting at. 572 deaths per million on uh, the 20th of June and Spain, they were sitting at 605 deaths per million on the, uh, on the 20th of June. Uh, I don't know what the data, what the, what the number is for Spain. I could figure it out, but it's irrelevant. We'll use Italy as the example. The average age for death from COVID-19 in, it, in Italy was 80 or is 80 years of age, okay? So it's killing old people. Now, these are people, and sadly, who would have lots, who would have lived longer. Thanks, mom. They might have lived into their 90s or their hundreds. But what's happening is, here's my opinion. We'll see if the data bear out my opinion. The average age of the world population is going to decrease significant. It's going to be significantly decreased next year. Okay. Because lots of old people died and not that many young people died. And the average IQ of the world is going to increase because people who listen to Donald Trump are going to die. So stupid people are going to die and people who pay no attention to the rules are going to die. And de facto, the average IQ of the world has to increase. So the world's going to get younger and smarter. And the, 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 and the, and and they're they're not, they're not related. They're not related They're It's not that it's not like the old people weren't smart. It's that the young people who die from it were dumb. The old Mm. people were sadly, taken away too soon than they should have been. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was, in fact, a pleasure uh, hearing your creative and interesting views. I'll um, uh, request... Uh, and somewhat uh, controversial. Uh, they, the creative views are at times controversial, sir. The controversy comes, in fact, if you are being creative and honest. Uh, I'll request uh, uh, Dr. Raghavi and Sharma uh, to please propose a vote of thanks. And uh, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malvia. Uh, it has been a great, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to propose uh, or to have been called to propose this vote of thank. Uh, I'm thankful to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, who has initiated this idea uh, to organize and to convene such kind of webinars, which are very informative. Uh, 
and I also would like to thank Dr. Robert Sinclair, who has accepted my invitation and who has agreed uh, to deliver this uh, web talk early in the morning for his time, because I think uh, Canada is nine, in, uh, nine hours, 30 minutes uh, uh, behind us. We are nine hours, 30 minutes ahead of Canada time. So it was early morning for him. Thank you so much, sir. You have spared your time. I know that you are busy nowadays, uh, and thank you so much again and again. I you appreciate it, and as I said, I'm more than willing to stay online if people want to chat some more and ask questions. And if you don't want me to, I'll leave. <laughs> there you okay. go. <laughs> okay, we, we have time constraints, sir. Uh, next time, we I don't have any time, have time constraints. Time. You guys may have time constraints. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Dr. Sinclair, maybe perhaps we can plan another session in uh, near future. Ah, uh, correct, correct, correct. Sure. Correct. Well, you know what? Uh, why don't we Why don't we plan a uh, brainstorming session rather we'll than? Plan. Uh, we, we, uh, we certainly plan, sir. We certainly plan and coordinate with you. I'm also thankful uh, uh, for my faculty colleagues who have coordinated, who have helped me to organize this event. Uh, I'm really thankful to the or patient listening uh, of the students, of the participants from across the country. Thank you so much. At last, but not the least, I would like to say thank uh, to Akhilesh, uh, Mr. Akhilesh, he's our system administrator. He's really, really working hard nowadays. Thank you so much, Akhilesh. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. May I close, sir? Sir, sir? Uh, thank, th thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, you Dr. Sinclair, once again. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Robert. See you soon. Thank uh, you. Thank, thank you, you very much. It was my pleasure. I enjoyed every second of it. Thank you. Bye bye. I hope Thank I you, I sir. hope I conveyed some information that was worthwhile. Of course, of course, of course, of yes, course, sir, certainly, of certainly. Course. Thank you so much. See you. Bye bye. Akhilesh, you can.